Good morning. It's, it's really great to be back here and to see everyone again. Um, for those who are visiting, I'm not the full-time minister here. I'm just, uh, just visiting. I've been here one time previously. That was, I guess, about a month ago now. And the last time I was here, we took a look at the book of Haggai. Prophecies from the prophet Haggai, really short book, two chapters. And there was two major themes that we followed from the book of Haggai. One was, he was trying to motivate the people to rebuild the temple. And we considered at length, why were the people not motivated to do this on their own? We looked at that specifically in Haggai's first report. They didn't have their priorities right. They were more concerned with paneling their own houses. And they apparently had never taken the time to reflect personally on their relationship with God. Because God, through Haggai, multiple times gave them the command, consider your ways. Um, and then the other thing that we tracked was a future hope. Hope for a future or a glorious temple that was going to be glorious than the former one. And this hope was to also contribute to motivate them to rebuild the temple. You remember Haggai talked about a future shaking of the heaven and earth that's going to come. Um, and we looked at that, and that was referenced in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. And we showed how that clearly pointed to Jesus and what Jesus would establish in his kingdom and his church. When we introduced Haggai, we started in Ezra, chapter 5, verse 1, because that's where Haggai is introduced. But there's another prophet mentioned with Haggai, and that was Zechariah. So I thought as a, as a follow-up this morning, let's look at uh, the prophet Zechariah. <clears throat> um, so the historical background for the book of Zechariah is the same as Haggai. Okay? So the Jews had been taken captive by the Babylonians. They were there for about 70 years. They had seen uh, three kings of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, his son, and his grandson. And then uh, the nation of Persia takes over, and Cyrus the Great, it says, was roused by the Lord in Ezra chapter 1 to release the Jews back to their homeland, to Jerusalem, and rebuild the temple. So they come back, they build the altar, they're starting up their religious practices again, um, and they start to build the temple, the foundation's laid. You remember they looked at it and they were like, oh, this isn't as glorious as I thought it was going to be. And then they meet some adversity. The adversaries, it says, of, of the people there were uh, frustrating the work. They write a king. Uh, they write a letter to the king in Persia saying, if you let them rebuild the temple, then they're not going to pay you taxes and they're going to rebel. Just go and look at what happened in history and sure enough, they convince him to stop the work of the temple. It stops for 15 years. 15 years later, under the reign of Darius in Persia, they start to rebuild the temple. That's when Haggai and Zechariah are writing to motivate the people to rebuild the temple. Um, so an, for, an overview for the, the book of Zechariah, it's 14 chapters. The first six chapters are eight visions. Um, and it says that it happened in the 11th month of the second year of King Darius. If you remember, Haggai mentioned four reports, and the last one was in the ninth month. So this comes about two months after Haggai's prophecies. It's these eight visions. They're super weird. Um, they involve a lot of objects that don't seem to be connected. They do things that you wouldn't expect them to. A scroll is flying through the air. There's a woman in a pot. She's floating in the air. There's horns. It's really weird. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those visions. Chapter 7, the people ask a question. Um, they had been fasting for 70 years under Babylonian captivity because the temple was destroyed. And they come back after all these visions. It's clearly pointing to the temple being rebuilt, and it's giving them hope. And they say, do we need to continue to fast? So that's addressed in chapter 7. And then the rest of the book, chapters 8 through 14, are three divine announcements from God that's relayed through the prophet Zechariah. Chapter 8 is one. Chapters 9, 11, and, and 9, 10, and 11 are another one. And then the last announcement is 12 through 14. Chapter 9 actually starts out with a pronouncement from the Lord, and then chapter 12, the same thing. So that's an outline for the book. <clears throat> now, if you were to just read Zechariah, it's difficult to read for the first time. If, you've, if you're unfamiliar with it, it comes, up, it comes across pretty confusing. It's difficult to interpret, and especially the visions. You're sitting there going, this imagery is weird. It, it's probably much like the dreams that you've had yourself, things that like, you would never think to combine different like, experiences that you've had. And um, it, it's difficult to, to understand. Um, and so... Um, 
our guide this morning. I wanted to mention two verses that will give us some perspective for interpretation. One of them we read last time, and that is Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 47. This is Jesus speaking. It says, Now he said to them, These are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, first five books of the Bible, Torah, and the prophets, of which Zechariah is one, and the Psalms, referring to the writings. That's the whole Old Testament. It says, Jesus said, it must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and he said to them. So here is Jesus' summary of the entire Old Testament, right here. Thus it is written, that Christ would suffer and rise again the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So when Jesus summarizes the Old Testament, that's his conclusion. That's certainly a relevant perspective and an appropriate one to take when we're trying to understand what is Zechariah telling us? Is it relevant to us? Of course it is. It was relevant to the people as well. And it did point to Jesus, and it, that was supposed to give them hope. And we will see that uh, later today. The other perspective for trying to make sense of this is to consider Ezra chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Now, this is where Haggai and Zechariah are introduced. Here's what that says. When the prophets, Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek. Remember, Zerubbabel was the governor at the time. He was through the royal line of David. Everybody's thinking he's going to be king. We'll see. We'll talk about that later as well. And then Joshua was the high priest. So it says, those two arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. So keep that in mind. Ezra makes it clear, whatever Haggai was writing about, whatever Zechariah was writing about, it was to support this effort to rebuild the temple. Rebuild the temple, things pointing to Christ. That's our perspective. Now, these two principles for understanding Zechariah are connected. Motivation to rebuild the temple and hope for Christ. They're connected. And here's the point. The hope for a more glorious future, which we now know with our 2020 hindsight pointed to Jesus, that hope was supposed to motivate them in that time, in their time to rebuild the temple. And it is most definitely a relevant message for us today. The hope that we have in Christ, the hope that has now been revealed to some extent with the establishment of his church and his resurrection from the dead, that too is supposed to give us hope for today. And we saw that in Haggai. Remember in Haggai chapter 2, verse 6, it talked about a future shaking of heaven and earth. Remember the context for that. What, what was Haggai um, actually even talking about? What, what, was, uh, what was going on was the people looked at the foundation and they were discouraged. They could sort of extrapolate and, fi and figure, when this thing's complete, it's not going to look like the first temple. The first temple was way more glorious than this one, and they were discouraged. And God's message to them was this. Don't worry about your inabilities. Take courage in a way, anyway. I am with you. God is with you. And then he says, a future temple is coming. So the context in Haggai for mentioning this future event, the future shaking in heaven and earth, the context is that was directly related to their disappointment in themselves to build a glorious temple. Be hopeful. Be encouraged. Do it now because of this, this future event that's coming. So that's the context. Now, Zechariah talks much more extensively about this future kingdom, and there's a number of characteristics that we could talk about. This new Jerusalem, we explored some of them in Hebrews before. We could talk about any number of them. For the sake of time, I've picked out just one to focus on this morning, and that is uh, the concept of the merging of the offices of priest and king. When we combine and take together some concepts in Haggai and Zechariah, consider them together, they appear to be pointing to this future event being characterized by the king and the priest working together in a much more harmonious way than they had ever before. And we will show how that points to Jesus. You know, throughout much of the Old Testament, we, we can follow the line of priests through the Levitical priesthood, starting with Aaron and his sons. And we can also follow the line of kings um, through the royal line of David. But never ever in Israel's history had there been a person who was priest and king for the Israelite kingdom. Never. Now, there was simultaneously priests and, and kings at the same time, but never um, was their role one and the same. Priests were the religious leaders. 
kings ruled the land and were involved in military efforts and dealings with other nations, but uh, they didn't necessarily function directly together. A concept that we're going to follow this morning in Zechariah that's alluded to here is a much more harmonious relationship between priests and kings. And you may remember, it's not totally unprecedented in the Old Testament, priests and king working together, and we'll look at Melchizedek for that reason later. He was a priest and a king. All right, so what I want to do first is let's look at three passages to build up to this point about Zechariah alluding to the harmonious relationship between priest and king. The first one is going to come from Zechariah chapter 3, the whole of chapter 3 here. This is Zechariah's fourth vision of a total of eight. What happens here is Joshua, who is the high priest, in this vision, he's being accused by someone. Someone's sitting there accusing him. And some translations call this person the accuser. Um, that's like the JPS uh, Jewish Publication Society Tanakh translation, which is from the Masoretic text, a direct translation from the Hebrew. Um, that calls it the accuser. Others will translate it Satan. But in any case, the accuser is rebuked in this vision, and they're told that God has chosen Jerusalem. You see Joshua, he's wearing filthy garments. And we learn later that the filthiness represented iniquity. These are removed, and then clean robes are placed on him. So I want to look at verses 6 and 7. In this vision, an angel comes and speaks to Joshua, the high priest, and this is what he says. Thus says the Lord of hosts, verse 7, If you walk in my ways, and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house and also have charge of my courts. And I will grant you free access among these who are standing here. So we see Joshua is placed in a position of leadership here. He's told he's going to govern the house and he's going to have charge in the courts. Now, this isn't totally surprising. Uh, priests were supposed to serve in God's house, and they also took charge in, in the courts. You can see in, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 9, it makes a reference to the Levitical priesthood having a play in determining legal matters, uh, determining verdicts, and, and things like this. Um, but mention, I'm mentioning this here because Joshua took a back seat in the book of Haggai. Um, it mentioned, if you look at all the reports of Haggai, the first two say, speak to Zerubbabel and to Joshua and to the people. And then the second report in Haggai is, speak to Zerubbabel first, and also Joshua and to the people. And then the last report in Haggai has nothing to do with Joshua. It totally focuses on Zerubbabel, and it even lifts Zerubbabel up. Remember, Zerubbabel was the governor, and Haggai definitely placed more of an emphasis on Zerubbabel. If you would, just flip a few pages back to Haggai chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. It says, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders will go down, every one by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. So, Joshua and Zerubbabel all throughout Haggai are viewed together in sort of this dual leadership, but Zerubbabel more so, a reference to him like a signet ring, that's uh, a nature and a characteristic of kings. Um, but now in Zechariah, Joshua the high priest, the first time either one of them is mentioned in the book of Zechariah is Joshua. So that, that's worthy of note here. This is the first mention of either one of them. And as we develop this more, we're going to see that Haggai and Zechariah together, when we consider them together, they point to a dual leadership between um, Zechariah and Joshua, which represents a dual leadership between the kingly person, the king, and the priest. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's continue. Look in verse 8 before we move on from this section. Verse 8 says, Now listen, Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, Indeed, they are men who are a symbol, for behold, I'm going to bring in my servant, the branch, with a capital B. I just wanted to mention this really quickly, because anyone who reading, who's reading this and has read other prophetic writings is immediately reminded of all the other places where it talks about the branch. The branch is a concept that's very common throughout other prophetic writings, and it clearly pointed to the Messiah. Now, um, we're going to elaborate more on this in chapter 6, later on in the lesson, but I just wanted to bring it up because it's mentioned first in Zechariah here. 
in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 15, it says, In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to, to spring forth, and he will execute justice and righteousness on the earth. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 2. A shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Anyone familiar with these writings would have understood when Zechariah mentions the branch, we're talking Messiah here. We're talking future king of the, of the ideal Jerusalem. Okay, so that lays uh, a bit of the framework. Move on to chapter 4. This is the fifth vision now. What happens in this vision, you'll remember if you're familiar with it, there's a golden lampstand. It's got seven lamps. There's a bowl above it, and there's these pipes that go to each of the lamps. Connected to the bowl are more pipes that go to two trees, olive trees, on the side of the bowl. And this is what uh, Zechariah sees. In verse 4, Zechariah asks, what does this mean? And in verse 10, he gets this answer. For who, is dis who has despised the day of small things? But these seven, talking about the lamps, will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These, the lamps, are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. So the answer here is, these lamps are the eyes of the Lord. They see everything. They cast light on everything. This light is never dim. And the fuel is coming from these two trees, olive trees. It's not like you have to go in and pour in oil all the time. It's continuously supplied. So in verse 11, Zechariah says, what are these two olive trees? on the right of the lampstand and on the left. And the answer comes, I answered the second time and said to him, what are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden pipes which emptied the golden oil from themselves? So he answered me, verse 13, saying, don't you know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Here's the answer in verse 14. He said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. So it says two anointed ones. Um, other translations say the two anointed dignitaries. That phrase there is literally translated sons of oil, right? It was these, these olive trees. And based on the larger context of the book, we connect these two trees, these two dignitaries, the anointed ones with Joshua and with Zerubbabel. And you can make that connection throughout the book. Um, and in, in the sense of both of them being anoint, anointed with oil, Oil was used to anoint priests, and Joshua was a priest. We see that instruction in Exodus chapter 29, verse 7, but also Samuel, when he anointed David in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, anointing David as king, he used oil. So the anointing of a person with oil is a characteristic of kings and of priests. And you've got here Joshua and Zerubbabel together, working with God, this lamp, Special attention giving, uh, given to both of them in that respect. Both of them are being lead, lifted up in that sense. Um, flip back to, or go back up to verse 9 and 10 of this vision. It says, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And then it goes on, uh, we, we read verse 10 earlier, for who has de despised the day of small things? Um, where it talks about the small things there, some translation have small beginnings. This is a reference to the foundation of the temple that has, has already been laid. Who, who has despised the small beginning? Um, and it's, it's referring to the same thing that Haggai talked about where the people were uh, discouraged. They were disappointed in what they had saw because they felt like this temple that was going to build on this foundation was going to be not glorious enough. Um, and so this is being addressed again here in Zechariah. I just wanted to bring this up here. Okay, Keep this in mind for where we go next. Verse 9, chapter 4, says who would finish the temple? Zerubbabel is finishing the temple. Zerubbabel was going to be made like a signet in Haggai 2.21. Zerubbabel is one of the anointed dignitaries. You're sitting here thinking, whoa, is Zerubbabel the Messiah? But wait a minute, Joshua's lifted up just as high. He's another tree supplying oil in this, in this service with God, who's the lamps, and his eyes are the lamps. You see the concepts sort of coming together. We're going to try to time, to time together here in just a moment. One more passage to look at before we try to connect these things is in chapter 6. 
So this follows the eighth vision, the last vision. Um, and we're going to look at Zechariah chapter 6, verses 11 and 13. So 11 through 13. It says, Take silver and gold, make an ornate crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Then say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is Branch. This is the other reference to the branch in the book. Behold, a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. The connection is really coming together here. Look at verse 11 again. Take silver and gold, make an ornate crown. Um, in other translations, the crown there is plural. Crowns. And then it says, and take one and place it on Joshua. Now if you're reading this, remember before we were like, okay, Zerubbabel, the signet. Zerubbabel, the anointed one. Um, and Zerubbabel would be the one to finish it. You're sitting here thinking, all right, crowns are being made. Zerubbabel and this vision's getting ready to be crowned king. It's going to make it clear, finally. Zerubbabel is the branch, right? No. He takes the crown and puts it on Joshua. But Joshua's the priest. He's not the king. Zerubbabel was the governor. He was the one that was the royal descendant of David. He was the one that was going to be made like the signet ring. So we were expecting it to be placed on Zerubbabel. The irony is the crown gets placed on Joshua. Okay, verse 12, we have our second reference to the branch. It says the branch would build the temple. But just a minute ago, two chapters ago, it said Zerubbabel was going to be, build the temple. So is Zerubbabel the branch? What temple are we talking about here? In verse 13, speaking of the branch, uh, the, the, the New American Standard Bible reads, thus he will be a priest on his throne, talking about the branch. The council of peace will be between the two offices. The JPS Tanakh, which is a translation from the Hebrew, the Masoretic text, says, and there shall also be a priest seated on his throne, and harmonious understanding will prevail between them. And the Septuagint replaces uh, the, the phrase seated on his throne with seated on his right side. And we'll see a reference to the throne and on the right hand of God in a moment pointing to Jesus. But the idea in connecting all of this appears to be that there's a time coming where the offices are going to be merged. That's what it says in verse 13. There will be both priest and king in one harmonious functioning role. Um, and this is not totally unprecedented, as we mentioned before. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, points to this idea being uh, manifest in one person. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. <clears throat> And the role spoken of here seems to be similar. This branch, which in other prophetic writings is referred to or looked at as the Messiah, the branch would finish the temple. And at which point in verse 13, apparently priest and king are going to work together like they never have before. So this is pointing to the future establishment. It's connected with that future shaking event that's mentioned in Haggai 2.6. And it's referenced in the Psalms as well. Consider Psalms... Uh, the 110th Psalm, verses 1 through 4. That's what this says. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, an allusion to a thing of kings, saying, rule in your midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. That's in Psalms. So the, connecting all of this stuff from Haggai and Zechariah, lifting Joshua and Zerubbabel up, giving both of them and each of them special attention in some regard, looking to them as kings, looking to them as these priests. And in, in Zechariah 6.13, saying that the offices would be merged, each sitting on their throne. And then we connect that to Psalm 110, understanding that, yeah, a direct prophecy was made about someone, a characteristic of this new kingdom having a king 
after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, also a priest. And, and by the way, the reference to the order of Melchizedek also refers to the perpetuity, the, the, the never-ending nature of this kingdom. And what I'd like to do now as we finish is look at that connection and it clearly being a, uh, a reference to Jesus. The promise was made to, to David that his descendant would sit on his throne forever. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13 says, He will build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And the ideas in Haggai and Zechariah might have led you to expect Zerubbabel to fulfill them, but here's the fact. In history, we understand Zerubbabel did not ever become a king in Israel. We see these prophetic writings, and maybe a lot of people would have read them and expected that to happen. Zerubbabel never became a king in Israel. So were these prophecies wrong? No. It was to be interpreted as Zerubbabel representing the royal line of David. And yes, there was going to be a king in that royal line to reign forever. And this pointed to Jesus. Both genealogies, in Matt, one in Matthew and one in Luke, show Jesus to be a descendant of Zerubbabel, and, and therefore also in the royal line of David. And the New Testament writings clarify that all of this was fulfilled in Jesus. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus, right before giving the Great Commission to the apostles, says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Authority is a thing for kings. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, quotes the 45th Psalm. Verse 6 says and clarifies that it was talking about Jesus, where it says, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. <clears throat> so Jesus here is clearly indicated as a king and having authority as of a king. But he's also indicated as being a priest. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. So we saw a metaphorical connection being made between priest and king when we read through Haggai and Zechariah. And now we've seen passages that allude to Christ as king and that allude to Jesus as the priest. And the writer of Hebrews also directly and explicitly connects the two in, in one passage, or in several passages actually. And um, we'll look at some of those. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, for example. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in, in the heavens. That's a connection exactly to Zechariah 6.13. Seeing the vision of Joshua the priest um, being crowned, and then the branch, both of them seated on their throne. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Although he was a son, he learned obedience <clears throat> from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, who was a king and a priest. And he elaborates on this more basically for the entire chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews. In verses 1 through 3 of Hebrews 7, it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, there it puts both in, in, in the same line, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils. You see, the Jews really revered Abraham. But the point he's making here is, Abraham paid tribute to Melchizedek. And he's making this point, Jesus is a priest and king after the order of Melchizedek, someone that even Abraham looked up to. Was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, now literally, no, he had a mom and dad, but it clarifies it saying, without genealogy, it wasn't recorded for, for this person, Melchizedek. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. So Jesus is a priest and a king after the order of Melchizedek. In what respect? Well, he's not a Levite. Therefore, there's a change in law. Paul talks about this in Galatians 3. But also in the sense that there's no recording of the end of life of Melchizedek. He certainly died. But as far as the record is concerned, his priesthood and his kingdom are still in effect. And in the same way, Christ is priest and king of a, an eternal kingdom in that same order. And also, after the order of Melchizedek, in the sense of he's a priest and a king. 
And the connection, now the point is this. You take Jeremiah on its own. You take Isaiah on its own. You take Haggai or Zechariah on their own. And it can be confusing. You, you can get lost. You can lose the forest for one of those trees. But it is incredibly connected. In, in an amazing way that all of them together pointed to Christ in a, in a beautiful literary fashion. All of it was fulfilled in Christ. And we've just shown that with the priest and king nature, but also for the branch. Remember that Zerubbabel was connected with the branch because in Zechariah 6.12 it said that the branch would finish the temple, but also in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 9, Zerubbabel would finish the temple. So we read that and we said, all right, so I guess Zerubbabel is the branch. But of course, Zerubbabel never became king. And with the other prophetic writings, we're going, okay, the branch was a reference to this future messianic king. And this clarifies for us now, with our hindsight, what it meant when it said finishing the temple. Did, did it mean finishing the temple for the Jews? Yes, it was, a, it was a message relevant for them. They needed to come back from captivity and rebuild the temple. And, and it was a, a, a justified effort. God literally did rouse them to do that, and they did finish that temple. But that doesn't mean it can't have a dual meaning. It did point to another temple. And this is clarified in New Testament writings. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22 says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also being built together in a dwelling of God in the Spirit. You're a part of this temple of which Christ is the cornerstone. A temple which Christ built, beginning with His death and His resurrection. This was an allusion being made to back in Haggai and Zechariah and all these other prophetic writings. Look also at 1 Peter chapter 2. And if you want to turn there, this is where we're going to finish. You might have been wondering what... Does 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9 have to do with all this lesson? That was our scripture reading. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the connection now. 1 Peter chapter 2, <clears throat> starting in verse 5. You also, as living stones, you're being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, which we just saw was Jesus. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Now, Haggai and Zechariah pointed to the future shaking. We had already talked about the context. Why did it mention it? What was the point of mentioning it? Well, Haggai, in the context, it was to motivate them to rebuild the temple. You take courage now because you have a hope in a future unshakable, imperishable kingdom and establishment and salvation. And that is exactly what Peter says is the relevant message for us. This is our scripture reading. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again. Here's the connection. See if you can make it. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Was that a building of a temple? It was. And we'll show that in a minute. Let's keep reading to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. You run into hard times. They, rebuilding the temple, ran into hard times. They needed motivation. What did Haggai point them to? A future hope. A future, unshakable, imperishable, never-ending establishment. And Peter's doing the same thing here. You've been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith, verse 7, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. I hope you can see yourself in this message. Because we too have not seen Him, as apparently the readers of this letter had in verse 8. 
but yet we love him. And we don't see him now, but we still believe in him. Now I want to close in verse 3 there. Look at this again. Peter says, He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Haggai said, you take hope, take courage now. Why? Because future shaking of heaven and earth, future establishment. And Peter here says, you, tells you and them and me, take hope. Why? Well, through the resurrection. We have a hope through the resurrection of Jesus. It's the same hope, actually, the same hope for the people in Haggai as it is for us. We have hope for a more glorious temple, and that is Jesus, actually. John chapter 2, verses 18 through 21. John chapter 2, verse 18 through 21. Jesus is doing these miracles. People are asking him, by what authority do you do these miracles? Look at his response in verse 18. Or or here's the question. The, The Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days... I will build it up. The Jews said to him, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Peter says, take hope. You have hope. What? Through what? The resurrection of Christ. Jesus said that resurrection is the building of a temple. And Haggai told the people, be encouraged, because they're coming a never-ending temple. No one will crush it. Not Babylon, not Assyria, not Egypt. No one will crush this. Make sure you're on the right side. Peter, Peter explains this hope. The Bible is an incredibly connected story with an obvious theme. And all of it works together to describe this message that all of us needed because in the very beginning of the book, sin is introduced, and all of you fall prey to that. And yet, the plan for salvation came, and the plan was we needed a Savior. We needed someone to pay for the sin, and they needed to be perfect. The bulls and goats wouldn't do it. And God sent His own Son to save the world, John 3.16. And this gives us hope. This morning, if you don't have that inheritance, I encourage you to seriously consider it. Where are your treasures? Where are your priorities? How is your relationship with God? Obtain this hope. Understand what was accomplished through the death of Christ, but but more than that, His resurrection. He defeated death. Somewhere it says it could not contain Him. The grave could not contain Him. He wasn't worthy of death because He knew no sin. You and I have. And the wages for our sin, which is death, was paid for by Christ. You can bury the old man too. Paul said that he was crucified, not literally. I mean, he was speaking. You too need to be crucified, but it's with Christ so that now you can live a new life in the flesh in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The baptistry is ready. If you need to, be ba- or if you need to come forward and as, David, or as the 51st Psalm says, after David committed the sin with Bathsheba, I need to renew my, my spirit to let go of the past, you can do that too this morning. Make your relationship right with God. Consider these things as we stand and sing our songs.